Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Factory. We are now in conversations that matter and today we want to talk about depression. Actually, the title is Depression, How to Handle it Effectively. And we have Dr. Vivian Carson with us, who has already been with us in an episode to talk about getting older without big pharma. And if you are getting older, as we actually all are, <laughs> you could watch it and go to our YouTube channel of the Wisdom Factory and find it there. So depression seems to be really a common state of modern societies. People feel depressed normally and they don't understand the reasons for it and they say it's an illness and the doctor gives them medicines to work on depressions mm. and I think Dr. Carson has a different idea and yes. do you want to introduce her a little bit? I would certainly and then I have some experience in my past with depression too and being kept functioning with pharmaceuticals. <coughs> functioning. Okay, it was great. <laughs> no, you <All> right. <laughs> and, you know, Dr. Carson is uh, has a really impressive uh, qualifications. Uh, she's got several degrees uh, and two doctorates, including degrees in psychology, metaphysical science, uh, clinical hypnotherapy, certification in some 17 submodalities. And she's a certified energy therapist, certified domestic abuse specialist, uh, trained in neuro-linguistic programming and just many, many, many other things. Uh, and she is also an ordained minister, which uh, it tells us a little bit about her non-professional life, so to speak. And today, with uh, all over some 30 years of experience behind her, uh, she's developed a unique methodology that she calls psychobiophysical healing. And it's with that that we approach today's subject of depression. Welcome, Dr. Carson. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. Okay, so when we start out, first of all, what do you think that depression is? What is your definition of depression? Well, you know, there are uh, clinical definitions of depression and there are non-clinical definitions of depression. Uh, I look at depression as a, uh, an expression of what's going on in someone's life. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so uh, I, th I think of it as a symptom as opposed to an illness uh, as such. And so I treat a depression through the root cause by getting to the root cause of what's making the person depressed. And depression is never by itself. It is always accompanied by anxiety, anger, uh, guilt, grief, stress, shame, pain. Of course, nobody ever talks about shame. Uh, so these all are negative emotions that are also a part of uh, of the depression uh, rainbow, if you like. And so <clears throat> I talk about depression as being uh, something that happens to people when they don't feel like doing or running their normal life as usual. They just don't feel like doing much of anything. I can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we are back. We had to push some buttons. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I'm going back to an earlier period in my life when, uh, when, the, when the life I was in just seemed like a treadmill that I couldn't see any way out of. Things happened that were out of my control. Uh, I got up and did my best every morning, and it was just a matter of tromping through the day, and, and somehow, you know being able to fall asleep at night. Uh, and of course, uh, the, I'm talking about the 80s, 1980s. And uh, what happened was there was a psychiatrist I could go see with my health program and they listened and then prescribed. And, uh, and I was taking, I think, 
well, butrin and some other things too, I, I don't remember. And uh, there was just no end in sight. Uh, I did function. And eventually, some of the symptoms went away, but I couldn't say that it had anything to do with the Wellbutrin. I, I, I can't say that at all. Uh, but I took them for a long time. You know, it was seeming, it was seeming like uh, this might be something I had to do forever. Well, uh, I didn't. Uh, and nothing terrible happened. <laughs> you know? So, Pardon? any side effects when you were taking the well well i mean there were there were nasty <clears throat> annoying things <clears throat> like dry mouth it was yeah. hard to speak like you know, now like, do you like, want like, some water it's is not it, it's not that it's not is that is it only the, the memory <laughs> of that that makes to getting uh, like this it could be actually uh, th that could be a, frankly a, a recurrence of a little symptom right there But that is not a problem for me. But uh, I'm talking about a long time ago. Uh, what, what, what I really recall was an inability to really talk uh, to my spouse at the time about things that really mattered in a meaningful way. Um, feeling uh, um, helpless, you know, like there was no way out. Those are many of the feelings that come with depression, uh, trouble, uh, trouble concentrating, trouble uh, making decisions, trouble addressing your own feelings, even knowing what your feelings are, uh, indecisiveness, even irritability, anger comes out, uh, moodiness, uh, loss of interest. Uh, loss of uh, eating patterns. So, for example, people either lose uh, large amounts of weight or gain weight. And uh, weight gain is something that's not always associated with depression. However, it is a big factor uh, because we gain weight in order to protect ourselves from something. And it can even be something within us. It can be our own feelings, our own emotions, our own moods. So, um, so all this is really interrelated, and the helplessness and hopelessness that comes with depression actually can happen to many, many people. It's estimated that one in five women in the world have depression, and that one in ten men. Now, why it's, it's worse in women? Uh, the only explanation I have for it is that we women have a lot more hormones than men do. Uh, but at the same time, we also go through increased hormonal production. And uh, changes during the menopause cycle can uh, absolutely cause uh, depress depression. And so it's uh, really important to be able to, uh, can you hear me? Because I look like I'm muted. Um, so it can cause problems in terms of uh, imbalances in your system. So what I do when I'm helping people to heal is balance, cause homeostasis to happen, which is balance in, in the entire system. And when you have balance, when the endocrine system is well balanced, when the hormonal system is well balanced, or when people are, have Uh, have when we have actually examined the root cause and I get to the root cause and process it neurologically. So then there is an alleviation, not only of, of symptomology, but also of the weight that people have been holding on to and, and carrying around with them. So there are so many other emotions that cause, that can be related to or even cause depression. There are normal uh, everyday life occurrences that can cause temporary depression in people, such as uh, something happening at the, the office, uh, work uh, place and so on, which can throw people off or in their social life and so on. Of course, the worst part is grief. Grief can cause severe depression. Uh, grief can be triggered, of course, by the loss of someone, and it can be through 
uh, through death, but it can also be through divorce, separation, the loss of a dear friend uh, can cause depression, uh, changes in which a person has actually no power or feels powerless over uh, can cause people to slide into depression. But it's not permanent. And what I want to tell people is that using medications is not necessarily the answer unless you're in crisis mode. If you are in crisis mode, fine, I'm all for it. However, most physicians treat it as a lifelong pursuit to be on the medications for the rest of your life. And I see children who've been, who've been uh, prescribed antidepressants, which I don't think is right. Um, and uh, there are other causes for the depression that have to be looked at beyond the naked eye, so to speak. So with children, with teenagers, uh, I'm, I'm really against uh, just prescribing something blindly to them. So uh, it's important to understand that it is not a permanent condition, that it can be changed. And with the work that I do, we get through to the underlying cause. The root cause is very deeply set in and can be usually it is somewhere in the past, the distant past. Uh, of course, when I'm treating a child, it's not in the distant past, it's in the present. Uh, so, uh, so I get to the root cause by asking certain questions and uh, I usually process the root cause uh, neurologically through the neuroplasticity of the brain, which is what helps them to heal. I can't hear you. Uh, that's something that uh, our audience might like to hear about, neuroplasticity. Can we talk in a minute? Because I see there are comments and I wanted to bring them up. Oh. Um, I bring it, I hope it works on the on the screen. Vivek says, as I understand it, spirituality is on the other side of the door that keeps one in depression. Meditation is a door one has to open to get to the other side. Um, what is your thought about that? And then there is a next, I, I put it together, which is Jeremy. He says he agrees with Vivek. Meditation and mindfulness can help many people that struggle with depression. Holistic health has to be a bigger priority, including depression. Yes, balance is important. Equanimity, finding sources of internal calm and peaceful. And peace are helpful. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I do uh, during the uh, treatment that I proceed with, with my patients, with all of them, as a matter of fact, is to teach them how to meditate, first of all, in a very personal way. They choose the kind of meditation that works best for them in terms of uh, uh, using, I, I help them with guided imagery and so on. So that's what hypnotherapy is. And as a doctor of clinical hypnotherapy, the first thing I do is to actually relax people, help get them at least in a state of alpha brainwave activity. And when they're, they are in that activity, they're relaxed enough so that they're open and receptive and the unconscious mind is open and receptive. So there are many phases to the treatment. There are actually three phases to the treatment that I have developed. I have developed it from scratch actually, but integrated many other modalities into it. And so, um, so there are three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase two is when I get to the root cause and process the root cause. And phase, phase one is when I actually begin the relaxation process and put them in charge of their own unconscious mind. Not too many professionals understand the role of the unconscious mind. And when you give people the power to take charge of their own unconscious mind and you empower them with that, and then they start to feel that they have a say in their destiny. There's no, no more helplessness, no more hopelessness. 
And so that's a very important thing that I start the treatment with, which is to actually put a patient in charge of their own unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. So aren't you there in contradiction to mainstream treatments? Yes. How do you handle that? How do you handle that? Well, I get a lot of criticism all the time. <laughs> it's part of what I do. And uh, doctors are not convinced about what I do until they see the results from their own patients who come to me and who get results with me where they have been medicated. Some people come in, they've been medicated for depression for 20, 30 years, and they're still depressed. So I ask them, is the medication working? And they say, yes. And I say, if it's working, why are you still depressed? Why is this going on that you're seeking help now? And then they understand that the medication can work to a certain extent in crisis mode. It can work for uh, to alleviate some of the symptomology. You see, here's the thing. Uh, regular, the regular medical profession treats symptoms. I treat the root cause. And there, that's a big... This is mm -hmm. so important, so yeah. important. Yeah. And can you perhaps uh, speak now a little bit about uh, neuroplasticity and how that yeah. fits? Well, you know, uh, years ago, when I first started to do this work, over 30 years ago, without dating myself, of course, uh, I started to tell people that we could change certain things within ourselves that were thought impossible to change such as what we've inherited, our genetic inheritance from our families. And at that time, there was nothing to support what I was saying. There was no research. Uh, now, only in the last five years or so, the research has supported what I've been saying all along, that we can change our genetic code. And so the neuroplasticity just means that the the, the brain is malleable enough that it can be changed. We've had uh, certain cases, uh, known cases of people, for example, uh, one violinist, virtuoso violinist that I can think of who was a young girl, I think she was 11 at the time, who had a complete hemisphere removed, the right hemisphere, because of epileptic seizures that were so severe. Uh, and she was told she would never play again. In fact, the left hemisphere took over all the different functions and eventually she was able to play again. She was not a vegetable. Uh, and she certainly did not lose her creative functions. So the brain is very adaptable. And my experience in over 30 years of doing this work has been that if you remove the offensive uh, uh, the offensive product, let's just say, that causes the problem, such as food, drink, such as thoughts that are negative, emotions that are negative. So everything begins with a thought and ends up somewhere in the body. And, and a thought becomes a feeling, which becomes an emotion, which in turn becomes a belief system. When the belief system is integrated or developed, it is set and it's very hard to change one's own belief systems. And so part of what I do is to bypass that area of the conscious mind, get directly to the unconscious mind and in turn process the root cause of the belief systems that are negative. And when I do that, people change their belief systems, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I can imagine there's some resistance to changing belief systems, however, from time to time. Hmm? That's why I, I prepare people. Uh, we do a consultation first, in which time I begin to introduce these new ideas and they're still new to a lot of people. And then um, there is the first phase in which I'm actually relaxing them, allowing to integrate the fact that they can relax. 
and that when they are relaxed, the depression disappears. You know, it's impossible to uh, be thinking negative thoughts when you are in a wonderful, beautiful environment which feeds your soul and in which you can feel the joy within you begin to rise. And so what happens at that point in time, the endorphins in the brain kick in, the serotonin levels uh, rise naturally, the dopamine levels rise, and so the brain is being fed what it needs to, uh, to be fed because in depression, the brain is devoid of those hormones which are necessary in order to be uh, feeling good about oneself. And uh, I noticed when I did a search on the internet about depression that uh, they're just saying, well, depression can be can ca be caused by, can be caused by a, a dysfunction in the brain. Well, the dysfunction in the brain is caused by the trauma, which is at the root cause. And that's what I have found through all these years of working uh, with people. And that is that the trauma itself, which causes post-traumatic stress disorder, can cause the depression. And so it is a hormonal adjustment that needs to be made. And of course, when you're relaxed and at ease and you are meditating, all the hormones normalize. And so uh, it feels good. It's a good feeling for people. And uh, they, they are calm and they're no longer down in the dumps. So it means that people need to be really willing to give up the old ways of thinking and, and being and not cling on the known hell the in known the face hell. of the unknown heaven, <laughs> something like that. Well, you know, our worst enemy is ourselves, you know? And so I have to point that out to people. Unfortunately, sometimes the resistance is so difficult and so set in and it can seem like something absolutely um, uh, that makes sense. It's part of their life. You know, they've been able to think in that way for uh, most of their lives. And so they come in in their 60s or 70s even. And, uh, and I have to, to tell them that what they've been believing all this time hasn't worked for them. Uh, so it's very difficult, as you said, Mark, the, uh, the biggest thing is the resistance that comes up. And so if they let me work through the resistance, we can get through. But in some cases, uh, it's not possible. I can count them on one hand, but it, nevertheless, they have come up. And uh, then I can say to the person, I have to say to the person, well, if you're not wi willing to change, then there's nothing I can do to help you. Yeah, this is at the root of every healing that we want to be healed. Mm -hmm. When we have a second gain of the problem we have, when there is some, how do you say second gain? We say that. Secondary, yes, secondary gain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then it's difficult to change because we fear to lose that. Why? Right. Because if, if you have a pattern that you are ill and you get attention when you are ill as a child, Exactly. And then, I mean, being healthy means you don't get mm -hmm. attention and nobody wants to, to, to be with you, you know, <laughs> something like that. So difficult yeah. to change when we don't change the other behavioral patterns and and and, I uh, and and what I usually tell people is there is a payoff for you to re remain in this situation. And uh, they'll say, oh, no, why, why would I want to be depressed? Why would I want to be in pain? And by the way, physical pain can be a result of depression as well. So it's a domino effect. One thing causes another, which causes another, and so on. And then it becomes impossible to untangle the web that you've uh, woven yourself. So this is the time to reach out to someone who can help. Now... A lot of people will go for traditional psychotherapy, and I was trained to do traditional psychotherapy as, as a, a psychologist. And I found that when I was working with people, uh, there was no healing. There was no end to the treatment. And, you know, when you work for an agency, they want you to keep them coming back. 
They don't want anybody to heal, you know, so that they can continue to talk. And some people have been in analysis or psychotherapy all their life and have not ever thought of what the root cause could be or how it could be processed or how they could heal. Yeah, this is one thing that uh, the psychologist or psychotherapist uh, wants to keep the people for to earn money. This is one thing. It's also understandable. Um, the other thing is my experience with psychotherapy that it's mostly on on the beta brainwave levels. That means that it's in, in normal speech, normal state of consciousness. And we talk a lot of stories. We tell people a lot of stories. You know, we try to make our normal games with the psychotherapist, but you never go where you really need to go. And this is in the unconscious, as you say rightly. Yeah. And with talking alone, you never arrive in the mm -hmm. unconscious. So it has to be some other means. We talked yeah. about meditation already. You talked about hypnotherapy. I think for many people, hypnotherapy seems to the, you know, on the stage, the person makes the do, 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 and then it can say, uh, do everything with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that it's not like this. And I would like, if you have time and <laughs> inclination to do that, to talk a little bit about hypnotherapy, uh, how you use it for, for depression. I would love to talk about hypnosis. It is something that's been misunderstood and misused by the media. And uh, people are made to believe that this is a hocus pocus magic. So I am not, uh, I am not a hypnotist, okay? A hypnotist is a performer who gets on stage and does those magic tricks, so to speak. Um, clinical hypnotherapy, which is what I'm a doctor of clinical hypnotherapy, is very different from someone who is also a hypnotherapist. A hypnotherapist is certified and the, uh, the amount of time spent in the learning uh, methodology of hypnotherapy is short. It can, someone can be certified as a hypnotherapist over, over a weekend, overnight. Whereas a doctor of clinical hypnotherapy takes a lot longer to get that credential. It takes a lot more study, a lot more, you know, you have to write papers and so on, and it takes a lot more work. Uh, so for one thing, I've been working with the unconscious mind for over 30 years. And that background also helped me. And when I was working as just as a counselor or, or uh, a psychologist and nobody was healing, I knew I had to go around another way. And so I studied hypnosis and I studied the brain. And, <clears throat> excuse me, basically uh, hypnosis is just a brainwave activity. It happens anytime you are relaxed. So it's not a complete healing method. Granted, it, uh, it slows down all your autonomic nervous system functions. So your breathing, your respiratory rate slows down, your heart rate and pulse rate slow down, uh, your blood pressure normalizes, whether it's too high or too low. And then uh, you're also your unconscious mind is open and receptive when you are relaxed. And basically that's what hypnosis is. Uh, it's just relaxation training. So I had to invent a healing method to go along with it. And so that's why what I do is unique and different and uh, nobody else works the way that I do, which is why I offer it nationwide. People can now heal uh, on, uh, on the uh, technology that we have available, such as Skype or FaceTime or any other technology such as this that helps us to see each other in real time so that uh, I can work with people, monitor their reactions and their breathing and actually uh, effect change when I process the root cause so they can see me and I can see them. So. All these are factors that are important. So hypnosis is not hocus pocus magic. It is a brainwave activity, put, putting it simply. Okay, thank you for that. As I understand it now, that would be hypnosis is a preparation 
for what yeah. you're doing then access the root cause is it that that in this hypnotic state people can remember better what has happened well, now that is uh is called uh, a regression and i do regressions into early childhood if necessary uh, i have found a way to do it painlessly and very quickly so that we don't have to spend months doing this as I said, in three, uh, in three phases, three sessions after the initial visit. So in three weeks, people feel that they have healed. Um, so it is uh, a laying down of the basics, which is the relaxation process, the opening of the unconscious mind. For me, it is the, the beginning. People ask me, are you going to hypnotize me? And I tell them, you hypnotize yourself all the time. You do a pretty good job. What I'm going to do is to dehypnotize you because you've already given yourself all these negative suggestions. Yeah, this is so great. Yeah. Dehypnotize. Mm. This is the real word. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it, it is amazing, though, Dr. Carson, you know, when you consider everything that happens to an individual, you know, beginning in utero and then through uh, childbirth and early childhood where there's no rationality connected with anything. It's, it's just all a receptive experience and whatever the world throws at you, <laughs> that's what you get, you know. And, and overcoming that, you know, is, uh, is a miraculous feat of growing up, you know, even overcoming. without trauma. Overcoming, I would more say that put it in the right parameters. All right, or in the integrate right, it, if you yeah, will. Yeah, integrate, okay. I would call right. it. Right, and, and here's where I can plug my book perhaps a little bit. Uh, I've written a book called uh, You Are More Than Your Body, Seven Steps to Healing Body, Mind, and Spirit, uh, and in which I talk about the fact that most of us have PTSD and are not, we are not aware of it. And that comes from trauma that seems unimportant, seems trivial later on in life. But there is always that factor to overcome. And I'm a prime example, having had a, a rotten childhood, not because of my parents or my family, but because of the environment at the time that I was living in. And so I talk about it in my book, and people can see that from my uh, modeling what I've been able to heal from, that the, therefore they can heal from their past. Yeah, this is this is great. We have to write the t title down under yes, the video. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this is a good thing to be able to use yourself as an example of what yeah. others can do. This is mm -hmm. inspiring others and. Then we come to the point, as we said before, that the others have to take initiative and want to get out of the, whatever the trouble is. It's not only a depression, you are use, um, healing uh, with this method, no? What, what, what else uh, is in your, uh, how do you say, in your problem box? <laughs> Other than what, depression. No, uh, when, uh, well, I treat just about anything. I treat severe physical illnesses. We reverse diabetes. We reverse uh, fibromyalgia. Uh, I remove pain, chronic pain. Now, this, this is the hardest part to sell to someone who is in pain, let me tell you, because physical pain is debilitating and causes depression as well. So when people feel helpless because they've been in an accident or something has happened to curtail their physical well-being, uh, then they get depressed and that is a normal outcome out of having, uh, or having been uh, placed in a position where they're helpless, you know. On the other hand, we have seen people who've lost their limbs and came out of it triumphant and joyful. You know, so what is the difference between these kinds of people? And that is all based on the thinking part and the eventual change of belief systems. So when I treat uh, pain, physical pain, 
I have to convince the person that it's possible for them to be free of physical pain. They've had for some, some of them 30, 40 years. And they've been on severe um, medications such as opiates of some kind, which are very strong, powerful uh, painkillers, uh, which in turn cause severe gastro problems, gastrointestinal problems and other emotional and physiological dysfunctions. And so they see no way out of it because that's what they've been taught, pain management. Pain management, as I explained to people, means you stay in pain and you manage your pain. How do you manage it? You go to your doctor, your doctor gives you a prescription. After a while, that prescription no longer works. They have to up the amount or they have to give you stronger medications. And it goes on and on and on like this. And the pain is never gone. I've treated people who've been on morphine and the pain level is a seven or an eight. Uh, I've, been, I've treated people who have a, a stimulator implanted in their spinal cord for, to remove the pain. And there's still a seven or an eight on the pain scale. So what I do is to actually interrupt the pattern, the cycle of the pain. All pain has to cycle through the brain and the spinal cord before you can feel it at the site of the injury. And so it happens in very, very quickly, the speed of lightning. So what I do is to work through the neuroplasticity of the brain to interrupt the cycle of the pain. And when I do that, the pain is gone. It's, again, it's part of my methodology. It's something I had to invent to, uh, to help people release their pain permanently and to tell people you can be without pain. Then they look at me and say, well, why have I suffered for so long then? And that's something I can't answer because, you know, they've been going to a different kind of treatment that is not helpful to them and that will never cause a healing. Uh, an MD considers it a cure when there's a slight alleviation of symptomology. A cure is temporary. What I do is help which is complete, body, mind, and spirit. There are seven levels of healing through psychobiophysical healing. But I won't bore you with the details because I think I said them last time you interviewed me. So uh, people can go to that interview if they're interested. So you are really running against a well-established belief system in science, in medicine, medicine and also other sciences. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, neuroplasticity uh, and um, epigenetics. epigenetics, they are coming out now and yes. seeing and demonstrating mm -hmm. that what is still the belief system of the others is wrong. So you need to be very strong to, to hold on. What sort of support do you have and what sort yeah. of support do you need to <laughs> get out uh, this message? You know, it is one of the reasons why we do that because mm -hmm. we are not happy about what mainstream mm -hmm. is and we are looking out for people who are doing things differently, have a different understanding like Robert mm -hmm. Sheldrake Mm -hmm. like Bruce Lipton, like Dutch Sands, who mm -hmm. we got to know only a short time ago because he is predicting earthquakes and he has predicted our earthquake here in Italy where 300 people died and nobody yeah. took him for serious and ah. he, he gets cut off from, from YouTube, from his live stream and censored and menaced and everything because there is fracking and oil industry mm -hmm. there behind. So we we really want to with the little means we have to support mm -hmm. the people who are fighting, fighting, I don't want to say fighting, but at the end is fighting yeah. for to end a belief system which is definitely wrong and which have something to offer which is evidently helping mm -hmm. because these people don't look to evidence. They right. just <laughs> believe. Right. Well, when they go back to their treating physician and tell them they're much better, the physician comes up with one expression, spontaneous recovery, you know? 
So uh, nobody gives me credit for what I do. However, uh, it's a good question. Uh, I would love to have the support of a community like yours uh, on a consistent basis. That's why I, I like to talk to you guys. You know, it's a wonderful thing to be able to speak freely about all this. Uh, I get calls from people all over the United States and, uh, and a lot of the time I get hung up on when I return their call. I mean, they're asking me a question, I'm answering their question, they hang up because they don't want to believe that it's possible to heal, you know? So those are not the people who that I'm going to be able to help. Uh, so I, I have, a, you know, a very strong faith and a very strong uh, determination within me that what I do helps people. And so I continue no matter what. Uh, sometimes, uh, maybe once every few weeks, I get a call from someone saying to me, uh, please keep on doing what you're doing. This is wonderful. Uh, it's so great. And thank you for your service. And when I get that, it makes up for all those hang up calls and all the negativity. And there are bodies of power, and I won't name them, uh, that try to keep me from doing what I'm doing. Yes, they try to stop me, yes. Well, you know, when you first brought this up, I didn't have a chance to say it, but I wanted to break in in a kind of humorous way and say, how can we help you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and you, you, you answered that. And I'm very, very, uh, very happy to hear that you are looking for a... Uh, uh, a circle of helpful people. And I am. I, I've been saying I'm looking for my tribe. I've been looking for my tribe all my life. Oh, I'm yeah. not in Italy, and I would love to be in Italy, as a matter of fact. I speak well Italian. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, in, in the United States, we have a need for this work. Uh, it's still backwards, especially in the area in which I practice physically. Uh, people are not open to what I do. And so that's why I've had to reach out to the rest of the country and the rest of the world, as a matter of fact, which is much more open and advanced. Uh, you know where we have systems that are uh, in place to help people to get help uh, no matter what their financial circumstances are, such as in Canada and in France where we have a social system uh, then, uh, and I'm not sure about what happens in Italy because it's been a long time since I was a child in Italy, so I haven't been there as an, an adult. Uh, so I don't know what the, uh, what the system is there. But uh, in systems that are much more open, then I could even work in a hospital setting. Uh, but here, it's not possible. It's not possible. In fact, the hospitals don't... Uh, ban me from coming in to help even one of my patients if they're if they're hospitalized yes. this is uh, you have to manage our doc here uh, italy is far behind you oh, really yeah really really far behind the doctors are so conservative there is every now and then there is somebody who has an understanding but when he is practicing the doctor of mark for instance in the practice he is acting like a normal doctor for fear of, um, you know, being <laughs> accused of not doing the right thing. So here is no way. Even, you know, I have done transformational coaching where we go also to, to in meditative states and to go to the belief systems, uh, probably in different ways as you do. But here in person, I don't find anybody who would be doing this, really. So it is a different way. We will still have to work a lot until we, we, we can show people that they can be free of their conditionings. Maybe not 100%, but even if you are only 10 or 20% freer of your limiting conditioning, isn't that worthwhile? Yes. Right. <laughs> at the end of every, of every treatment, I ask people to answer questions on a results questionnaire that I do. And uh, a lot of them, I am I'm shocked as to, even though the numbers speak for themselves, because I have a numbering system to show them their improvement and then their final recovery, they don't even believe their own recovery. 
you know? So I say, well, the numbers don't lie. Here you were when you first came in, and here you are now, and look at the difference. Oh, yes, that's true. Now I'm able to do this that I wasn't able to do then. You know, people with phobias, for example, fears. Uh, fear is what drives uh, depression, actually. And, and fears are ingrained in, from childhood. And those have to be processed. Those fears have to be processed. Uh, so once I process it, then people are so used to having been in the old modality that they're not ready to accept their new belief system. So I have to get them to actually accept their new beliefs. And that takes a, a little bit of doing as well. So it's, it's really difficult to say what environment will cause that, you know, will cause the optimal healing of a person. Uh, because there is no such thing as perfection. And so any, even a child raised in a loving environment can have some trauma happen outside of the family system, but mostly it's in the family and hasn't been even examined or understood. Not yep. even seen often, uh, realized, because when we... Um, have in our adult mind, we often don't know how it is for a little child. We yeah. sort of, you know, think that, that they are like us. <laughs> and maybe we, we even uh, laugh at them when they are really seriously trying to, to do something. And then we laugh and the oh. child doesn't know what to do with that. And then it gets the belief, oh, mm. I, there's something not right with me. When they laugh at me, then there's something not, not but okay. The real trauma in that case is the child nonetheless has to fit into the family. It has to go through all kinds of roundabout ways of making it okay, even though it may be a terrible situation. Yeah, and well, in a good situation, as Vivian said just yeah. now, even in a good family yeah. situation, there are these disappointments or these fear moments which uh, parents, good parents, can alleviate, but they can never take everything away. I mean, there are those parents who try to save the child from everything, but what they are doing is putting the child into a, a cage, and this will create all other sort of <laughs> That's stuff. By the way, overprotection uh, causes uh, asthma in children, believe it or not. So, uh, because they feel smothered, literally smothered. Uh, so that's not the answer. Uh, you know, children have to learn, but at the same time, we have to be very cognizant of the fact that their world revolves around them. And if something goes wrong in the family, they blame themselves. Uh, even when you tell them hundreds of times, it's not your fault. It has nothing to do with you. They will still take on some form of blame and there lies the root cause pretty often. Yeah, because children are not able yet to understand rationally what has happened. And even right. if the parent says it has nothing to do with you, they don't, right. they cannot get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why I start by empowering people over their unconscious mind and giving them the power to actually take charge of their unconscious mind because children are powered by their unconscious mind. And when I actually uh, do that and a patient is looking at me and saying, well, now I understand why uh, all the commands I've given to my child didn't work, you know, and I've been giving the wrong commands. And that's very true. Yeah. And so for the child, it creates a situation then when it is adult has to deal with it in one way or other. And when it doesn't, get it right, let's say, then it ends up in depression or as you say, physical pain or whatever can can come out of that. Mm -hmm. And the good news which you are distributing and which we really hope to distribute together yes. with you, that people can do something. Yeah. Yeah. And Absolutely. really Absolutely. we can change our mind, we can change our belief systems. And even if not 100%, maybe it's not needed to become a happy person. Maybe 5% is enough, you know, but do it, do it, do it. 
<laughs> well, you know, the, the whole idea of uh, traditional medicine is the placebo effect, you know. Uh, the placebo can be the, the happy pill they think they're taking. Oh, I have to be, I, I am happy because I'm taking my happy pill. And so it's just a change in the belief system. If they were taking something else, it would work just as well. Unfortunately, uh, those medications have consequences, side effects that are pretty negative. As you mentioned, Mark, uh, dry mouth is just one of the symptoms. Uh, double vision, uh, loss of hair, uh, loss of the ability to make decisions. In fact, if the, the, the medications can cause a rebound effect back to depression and listlessness. Certainly libido is gone and so on and so forth. And I could talk forever about it, but if you just look up the side effects of any of the antidepressants, you'll see a whole list, uh, a huge amount of side effects. And so what a medical doctor will say, well, it's worth it to help you to to get through this time. Well, if it's temporary, yes, but if it's going to cause problems, physical problems, physiological problems in the brain in the long run, and there is no medication that does not cause some change in the brain, then is it worth it? <clears throat> and yeah. now we can to the fact that people are using marijuana these days. Okay, now why doesn't marijuana work because marijuana gives the impression to people that they are happy, they're high, okay? And so they get that temporarily, so they want to get it more and more often, so they use it more and more often, and that leads to other problems in the brain. So I don't recommend marijuana, so please don't call me for a marijuana card or to, uh, to support you in you, the use of medical marijuana. It is not the answer. It masks symptoms and only getting to the real root cause and processing it will help you to heal. You know, you are mentioning the placebo effect. It is yeah. well studied even in classical medicine and still they don't get it. <laughs> so <laughs> how long will it take until we, they understand that it is not dependent on their chemical medicine? Maybe there is some industry behind who doesn't want us to understand. Uh, Might be. Do no? you suppose? Mm -hmm. We talked about big pharma. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Pharma tried everything. So, yeah. And we know that. So, uh, you know, as long as big pharma has the power, we're just a little cog in the wheels, unfortunately. But you know, when I go into the actual idea that, and this is going to blow people's minds, I think, in some way, the idea that we have chosen our life, that we have chosen our parents, that we have chosen to come into into in actually incarnate as the person we are. That actually we made all these sacred contracts before we incarnate. And that we have it all scripted before. In other words, we know who's gonna come into our life and the contract we made with them, whether it's temporary or long-term. It's actually mind-blowing to take uh, responsibility for what we create in life. And so beyond all this is the law of cause and effect, which is a science basically. For every cause, there's an effect. You strike a match, you get a light. This is scientifically provable. So the idea that we have chosen this uh, way of life is very hard for us to accept as human beings, because we are, after all, frail human beings. And the bottom thing that I remind people is that love is always the answer. That love is a powerful emotion. And I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm talking about just the idea of embracing every emotion 
embracing every opportunity we get to be really grateful for it. I look at every horrible, horrific thing that happened in my childhood as a gift for me to be able to develop what I've developed and to develop as a person. And so when we look at it from that perspective, we can only be grateful and appreciative. And so love at the bottom really is what heals us. If we love an emotion that seems negative, it disappears. It disappears. But again, we haven't gotten to the root cause through that. So the root cause, once it's processed, the person can then really feel true positive emotions, love, acceptance, receptivity. So many people are closed off to receptivity. Women in general have been taught to give, give, give. And what happens is a depletion in the thyroid production, in the thyroid glands. So a lot of women these days that I'm treating have a thyroid depletion, a hormone depletion, and they're gaining weight. And it's, it becomes a vicious cycle. What started what? And so we have to go back to when the root cause was planted, implanted in the first place. So what I hear you say is also, we cannot just say, I love and believe, want us make, <laughs> make to love, but we first have to uh, eliminate the obstacles to the capacity of really loving and what you also um, what i'm hearing is what you are repeating is a spiritual teaching of wisdom ancient wisdom yes uh, and it's 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 really great and when we begin to understand that then we can we can begin to to hear to uh, go yes. up mm -hmm. i i also go on you may i yes thank you. you all right yeah yeah i am i'm reminded we, we can be grateful for everything that happens in our lives. And when we're in that mood, it's pretty hard to be a victim. But right. nonetheless, you know, if we're pioneers, we're the ones with the arrows in our backs, you know? Yeah. Now, how yeah. do we be grateful for those arrows? Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to fit in here another uh, uh, argument. It's not an argument. Uh, el evolution happens by overcoming obstacles. If everything was always only nice, nothing would Which happen. Is. We nothing wouldn't go up. Is. So I think we are given, or from the beginning, as you say, or whenever, these obstacles, these problems to resolve. And when we take the challenge and resolve them in some way, and it depends how, mm -hmm. how we grow up. If we grow up in a, in a good way, or if we grow up in this way, or if we even go into permanent depression and want, don't want to go out anymore. So this is our decision to, to do that. Some people never grow up. Some people just never grow up. Uh, and, and they refuse to grow up. And the idea of, of uh, judgment and uh, analysis and being up in here is always primary. We've been taught that uh, reason uh, supersedes everything. That's scientific. So uh, we can't go by our emotions. But when I'm working with a patient, I tell them we're going to take the 12 inch journey from here to here, which is the longest and most difficult, but we do it very quickly. And the idea is that to give up judgment, to give up analysis, to give up obsessive thinking patterns, negative thinking patterns, uh, because when we're up here, I tell people you're in a bad neighborhood. You've got to get out of there. You've got to get in here where you are your higher self, where you are your unconscious mind and you're in charge of it. And so when you're in here, you have your freedom to be healthy and happy and healed. And Vivian, yeah, wow. Yeah. Uh, that's what <clears throat> I, uh, from my own experience, I was always here and I didn't even know that there's another place to be and I needed help to, to get to know how to get there because there was no other way. I mean, by myself, I would never have found it and I probably would be dead by now. I, I'm quite sure because I was set up into <laughs> perfectionist, rigid, 
right. way. <laughs> so uh, what I want to give, um, as we are coming to the end, to, to the viewers is there is a moment that there might be only a glimpse or something when it comes to you that this is now the moment you need to do something. Or you go sort of downhill and you know you will suffer all the time or you have the choice to do something you might not know what it is at the moment what you need to do but there is a way and you find out when you are in this understanding you will find out and some the right people will come at the right time for me it was a clairvoyant mm -hmm. who told me many things and i thought oh <laughs> okay <laughs> and it, you know it was not a voo -voo, clairvoyant very very uh how do you say? I was still in this scientific thing. No, everything must be re reasonable and so. So I could accept that it was not somebody with the ball and saying, oh, blah, blah. no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so I could accept that. And from there, the journey began mm -hmm. from here into here. Doesn't mean that I'm not here anymore, but now it, it at least I, I know I can go there. Mm. So this is my takeaway. What is your takeaway? Well, I just wanted to say very briefly that maybe the right thing for some person right now would be to meet Dr. Carson. Hmm. Yeah. And as you know, you don't have to live in her place. You can yeah. use Skype, uh, but telephone you also. Uh, yes, uh, I can give my email address, which, oh, no, my, uh, my website address, which is probably the best way to contact me. Yes, yeah. uh, and then I can give you and so it's drvcarson.com. So it's dr for doctor, v as in Victor, as for Vivian, c a r s o n.com. Very simple. Okay, wonderful. We'll make sure and so, that people hear that and yeah. see it in print. Then mm -hmm. for you, the last, last word, which you just still have to throw out before we close. The last word? love yourself love that part of you you have denied all this time so i have the last last word and i would say <laughs> dare to love yourself yes so vivian thank you so very much i'm glad to have known you through the women's wisdom circle and this was another wonderful talk and we will continue with yep. that so thank, thank you to everybody who has watched and will watch in the future. And please stay tuned and go to our website, which has changed a little bit. It's called now thewisdomfactory.net. And circle us on Google, come to subscribe for our YouTube channel, and you will find many interesting talks there on different topics, mm -hmm. but always interesting yeah okay. and some, sometimes i talk more than she does mm -hmm. <laughs> at least interesting for us <laughs> maybe not for everybody but okay thank you again vivian and we see you another time bye 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 bye, bye, -bye.